Well, welcome to Odessa Bible Church once again online. We're so glad that you've decided to join us today. We're in their children's area. This is the play lounge. Usually it's filled up with kids every Sunday and Wednesday night, and we miss all of them, and we miss you. But we're glad that you're visiting us online. This might be the first time that you visited Odessa Bible Church, and we're so glad that you've tuned in. I hope you'll take the time to fill out a visitor card, and when all of this gets behind us, that you'll come and visit Odessa Bible Church in person. We've got a lot of great things that we have in store coming up. Uh, we're still going for Christmas. Easter. Hopefully it'll all work out by then. We'll be able to celebrate a return to church on April 12th uh, with an Easter egg hunt on the 11th. But we don't know what's going to happen between now and then, but we're praying that we'll be able to worship with everybody here on April 12th. We'll have two services in English, one at 915 and another one at 1045 with a 1045 additional service in Spanish with Encuentro. And so it's going to be a great day and I pray that you can be involved in that and we all pray that this whole uh, situation that's surrounding our country will be put behind us quickly and we look forward to celebrating the Lord's resurrection on Easter. Take time and worship the Lord today through giving. Uh, you can do that at odessabible.org slash giving and to find a link there to give. Uh, we would appreciate that and know the Lord will bless you as you give unto Him. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the service. Praise the Lord everybody. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. We cry holy. We cry holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Sing holy, 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 holy. I want to see you, see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing holy, 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 see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love, as we sing holy, 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 I want to see. Over 
the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the tree And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever 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 Over the mountains and the sea Your river runs with love for me And I will open up my heart and let The healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands For I will always sing When your love came down Sing of your love forever, yeah. I could sing of your love forever. Mm-hmm. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love. I could sing of your love. Oh, I feel like dancing. Do I feel like dancing? It's foolishness, I know. But when the world is seen alive, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love
Or shall we sing it again? You're the name above all names. You're the name above all names. Hi, my name is Daniel Perez, I'm the pastor of the Hispanic ministry in Odessa Bible Church. And today I want to share with you a word that I just learned how to pronounce. I don't know if I pronounce it well, but the word is quarantine. Quarantine? Quarantine. Can you say that with me? Quarantine. Okay, quarantine is a word that created in us anxiety and fears. What happened to your mind when you listen to the word quarantine? That your city is on quarantine. What's going to happen with my job? What's going to happen with my kids? What's going to happen with my life? Yes, quarantine creates that feeling of anxiety in our heart. And now I was researching about what quarantine means. Quarantine is a period of time where you have to be isolated from people to avoid the virus. And if you are sick, to heal and prevent the spread, the spreading of the of the virus in others so when you are separate you are on quarantine and this is exactly what happened with us and the sin the sin separate us from god the sin separate us from our eternal life the sin is a disease that need to be healed by jesus the sin is a disease that we need to take care to reveal our relationship with god so when you take the word quarantine and put it in the context of the Bible, we find that the quarantine, the number 40, is a number that God used a lot to test his people, to test what is in his heart. Forty years spent the people of Israel in the desert. Forty days and forty nine was raining in the Noah's flood. Forty days the giant was tempted or was challenging the army of Israel. Forty days. Jesus spent on the desert fasting before starting his ministry. So when you read the word 40 or 40 days, that means it's a time where God is going to test you to see what is in your heart. Look what the Deuteronomy chapter 8 said, verse 2. And you shall remember that the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or not. What is in your heart? These 40 days are testing your faith. These 40 days are showing up what is in your heart. If in your heart is anxiety, I encourage you to run to Jesus. If in your heart you can find stress, I encourage you to run to Jesus. If in your heart you can find pain, I encourage you. To run to Jesus. Jesus is the best medicine for this quarantine. If you are listening to this message for the first time in your life, I want to encourage you to commit your life to Christ. I want to encourage you to accept Jesus as your Savior. And if you are listening to this for the first time in your life, I want you to make a short prayer, repeat this word, or use your own word and say to God, Dear Father, I accept that I'm a sinner and I can feel the pain, the anxiety, the, the anger in my heart and I need to heal that this virus. I need you as my medicine. I want you to come in my life and transform my life forever. I receive you as my God and Savior. Run to the cross, run to Jesus and you're gonna find forgiveness, redemption and eternal love. Thank you for watching. Fuck.
bow down Lay our crowns Feet Of Jesus Greatness of His mercy and love At the feet Of Jesus And we crown Holy, holy Yeah. 
you've done, Father, all that you continue to do, God. This morning, Father, just pray that you would bless our nation, Father. Lord, that you would heal those that are sick, Father. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Well, welcome to my backyard. Uh, this is my little place of solitude, a little courtyard uh, that Melly and I get to enjoy together with our children. And uh, I love this time of the year. I love the long days, the warm days with the cooler nights. It kind of reminds me of California until I smell H2S gas. And, and that's a, a quick reminder that I live in Odessa, Texas. But uh, this is where I live. And so we're trying to find different ways to just be creative. And uh, this is just a different scene. So thank you for joining us today online and uh, I'd like to have you take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 18. Uh, this time of the year you have long days and uh, warm days. The sun is causing everything to come to life but when the sun goes down here at about eight o'clock all of a sudden you have to go inside. We like to play outside for a couple hours. We'll play baseball or uh, wall ball or ride our bikes and it's it's fun because you can do it late uh, but when that sun goes down it's it's sad because it's the ending of a day. Of course we look forward to a good night's sleep but you never know what tomorrow brings and so it kind of closes the day and the day is finished and there's a different kind of sun setting inside of scripture that I want to look at today that has a, a different feel. The earthly ministry of Christ to this point in the story has been filled with all kinds of wonderful uh, crowd grabbing experiences, miracles of healings and uh, from the raising from, from the dead, feeding 5,000, walking on water, all of these different things that are taking place. It's just drawing thousands of people to come and hear what Jesus has to say. And all of this is meant to bring people to, to God the Father. Uh, that's my neighbor coughing down the alleyway and you might hear other things. I have no control over that. But uh, in the sun setting part of this, and he's throwing his trash away now. And so in the sun setting part of this ministry of Christ is that uh, this, this exciting period is coming into a period where it's going to be dark. Both spiritually and literally, the story takes place at night that we're going to look at today. And, and this ministry that Christ has been participating in and leading is that of offering a kingdom to the nation of Israel. And of course, they've rejected it and they've denied Christ his position as king. And now they will take uh, their plans that they have been plotting for some time and try to execute them and result in Christ being put to, get to death. And so if you have your Bibles, you look at John 18, and I, I want to focus on a, a three different groups of people. I know Jesus is right in the middle and he's forcing these entities to deal with themselves. You'll have the religious establishment, of course, that involves the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, and, and those who are uh, priests and they're involved in the temple and all of that involves and and you have that group of people then you'll have a disciple named Peter and then we'll have a new character to the story and that's Pilate but the story begins in 
Luke chapter uh, 18, or I'm sorry, John chapter 18, verse 12, and this is where the soldiers carry Jesus uh, to the high priest's uh, residence. He's the father-in-law of Caiaphas, and this high priest is known as Annas, and Annas is the official high priest according to the law. A high priest according to the law was to be a high priest for life, but the Romans liked to mess with those who were under their uh, thumb, and so they removed Annas as a high priest and put his son-in-law, Caiaphas, in place. Place. But according to the Old Testament law, that was supposed to be Annas until death, and leaves are falling uh, until, until death. And so they go to Annas because he's the official high priest according to the law. They'll get to Caiaphas in just a moment. But the first scene we go to is in the courtyard or the, the house of, of Annas. And this is where Annas is going to ask him several questions. And just in that next section in chapter uh, 18 of John, uh, in verse 15, we discover that Simon is following close by. He's another character we'll deal with in just a moment, but he gets close by to where he can uh, see Jesus and hear Jesus, but not close enough to be identified with Jesus. And so here, let's talk about Annas first. Annas brings Jesus into his uh, residence or inside the courtyard there, and he begins to ask him questions, as it says in verse 19. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. It's an interesting question that's layered. It's, Annas knows what Jesus has been teaching. He knows that he has disciples. What's really going on here is Annas wants to know if there's another plan behind the plan. He wants to know if Jesus has another group of disciples that are out there ready to act if in the event uh, the chief priests were to put Jesus to death. He wants to know if there's a plot underfoot to overthrow the religious establishment. And that's why Jesus responds the way that he does. And if you look at that, Jesus answers and says, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me and what I said to them. They know what I said. So Jesus says, I've taught everything out in the public. Why are you asking if there's something in private? And I think that's what Jesus is driving at is, is he knows what's behind the question. Annas is looking for a subplot, a sub theme. They know exactly what Jesus has taught. They know exactly what Jesus represents. They know what he has claimed to be. He has claimed to be God of very God. They know this, but he's wanting to discover if there's something else underfoot that he might need to be aware of before they continue to act in such a terrible, terrible fashion. And so he asked this question not to really seek an answer. He knows what the answer is or what, what Jesus has been teaching. He wants to know if there's any other threat that he needs to be aware of. There's something going on with the religious establishment that's finally come into a full preview here in this story, is that they know exactly what Jesus is teaching. They've just decided to ignore what Jesus has taught. And there's a group of people that will always do this. They know exactly what Jesus stands for. They know exactly what Jesus has declared to be true. They just choose to ignore him. And that's what the religious establishment has tried to do. They've tried to ignore Jesus, to put him off, to deny what he has been teaching. Because they don't want to bend. They don't want to submit to his leadership. They don't want to come under his rule. They like the things the way that they are. They're in control. They're in power. And so they're refusing Jesus. And they're going to do anything and everything to get rid of Jesus through this next uh, several hours. And there's a group of people in our culture today that do the same thing. We just choose to ignore Jesus. We don't want to bring him into our lives. We don't want to submit to his lordship of our lives. We don't want to invite him in any capacity. We want to ignore him entirely. And we do this to our own hurt. We know the claims of Christ. We know what the Bible says about our hearts. We know that we need a savior, but too many will deny him. And they do that to their own hurt. And that's what Annas is, is really leading here. He knows what Jesus has said. He knows the call to repentance for this covenant people. And they're refusing to repent. They're refusing to embrace Christ. And they do that to their own hurt. And so do we. We refuse him and it will end up leading to our ruin. And that's exactly what will happen to Annas. Jesus answers the question that he does and the way that he does and the guard who is staying next to Jesus decides to take matters into his own hand and he slaps Jesus. And you need to see that as more than just a, a slap maybe with the fingers. It's probably with the palm of his hand and it's probably across the face in some kind of a way. And so he smacks Jesus, unbeknownst to Jesus, it, it comes out of nowhere and knocks him. Jesus, of course, responds in, in an appropriate way. And he says, if I said what was wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if I said what was right, why are you hitting me? And Annas 
then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And has got exactly what he was looking for. He knows that there's nothing else underfoot. And he knows that they can continue with this plan to destroy Jesus uh, with the help of the Romans. Now, it, the scene goes back away from the religious establishment. And it goes to Simon Peter, who is standing and warming himself. And this is interesting that John includes in the previous section, John 18:15. Uh, he includes this comment about a charcoal fire. It's in the evening. It's really late at night. It's really early in the morning, perhaps. Perhaps, uh, just before 3 a.m., somewhere around in there, and so it's cold. And they've set up a charcoal fire. It's not a blazing fire that you might see on a beach or at a lake where they have big flames coming off. It's a charcoal fire. It's small. And what that creates is a more of an intimate setting, and it's a darker setting. And so Peter is assembled around a group of people who have huddled around a small charcoal fire to keep themselves warm. And so it's a little darker. They don't recognize everybody, but Peter is one to talk, and he talks, uh, and you can tell he's not from around these parts. It's kind of like when you and I might travel out of West Texas and go uh, to um, the north, might go to Michigan or Detroit, or we might end up in New York, or when I go to California, they know I'm not from around there because of the way that I talk. Well, it was the same thing for, for Peter. He was from Galilee. They're in Jerusalem. There's a different accent. And so they recognize something different about Peter, and three different times they will ask Peter if he is one of the disciples, and you probably know the story well. The third time Peter is asked this question, are you one of his, he denies it, and he denies it vehemently with anger and, and uh, tension in his voice. And He probably curses at the same time, denying that Jesus, that he had anything to do with Jesus. And as we discovered last week, Jesus, who knows all things, he also knows exactly where everybody is. He knows right where Peter is. And just as Peter denies him, Jesus turns around and looks at Peter. Luke tells us this, that Jesus was able to turn in the courtyard and see where Peter was, and they make eye contact. You see, Peter wanted to have Jesus in his life, but not too close. He wanted to keep Jesus with an eye shot, but did not want to get, be too identified with Christ. He wanted Jesus at a comfortable space. Jesus turns and looks at Peter, and just at that moment, Peter turns and sees Christ, and they make eye contact. I believe at that moment Jesus' heart sunk to a new level, not in the sense of, see, I told you so, but just in the sense of his heart breaks for what Peter is going to be going through. You see, Peter represents a different kind of follower of Christ in this setting. You have the, those who are the religious establishment. They're not following Christ at all. They're trying to ignore everything that Jesus has said. In fact, they're trying to destroy him. Then you get Peter. He's embraced Christ. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. But he is not willing to give Jesus everything yet. See, Jesus rep or Peter represents another group of us that we think we're doing pretty well. We think we've got a lot of things together. And if we can just add Jesus and he can fit in this little small compartment of our life, then it's a good thing and, and we'll have that extra bonus of Christ. But that's not how Jesus works. That's not how he operates inside the life of a believer. When you accept Christ as your savior, his desire is to save your entire life, not just your eternal life, where you go after you die, but this life that you're living right now, he wants to redeem it. He wants to remodel you from the inside out. I know I'm gonna ring a bell when I say Chip and Joanne. They love to remodel houses. Many of us watch their show. They take possession of a house and they, they wanna remodel it for this homeowner so the homeowner can enjoy it in a whole new level. At some point, they, they turn the, key, the homeowner turns the keys over to Chip and Joanne and based on Chip and Joanne's expertise and God-given talent, they give them the keys to the house and they begin to remodel the whole house. What would happen if that homeowner said, Chip and Joanne, we want you to, to come and be involved in this remodel, but you know, you don't get to do half of what you want to do. We're going to limit that. We're, you don't get to do that. We don't get to do that. They're going to have to do it, say, with one arm tied behind their back. They're not going to get full control of the project. The house isn't going to turn out the way that it's designed. It's not going to turn out with a great plan. In fact, it's going to be far less. It could be a lot better. It might hurt more if they just surrendered control to the remodelers, but it's not going to be as good as it could be. And we do that with our own lives. We only give God a part of it. We, we want to hold on to perhaps our ego. We want to hold on to perhaps our self-perception of what we're good at. We want to hold on to our agenda. We want to hold on to our sin. We don't want to submit to the Lord's authority over our lives. And so we, like Peter, would like to keep Jesus at a safe distance. Keep him over there. We'll stay over here. And in so doing, we put ourselves in an environment where we're going to deny him. We're going to deny his position inside of our lives. We learn that from Peter in this story as he runs off in tears. His heart is broken, and thankfully this isn't the end of his story, and it's not the end of yours either. We're all guilty of doing this at some level. 
denying Christ the position that he has earned and he deserves inside of our lives. And thankfully for Peter, we get to see him evolve into something so glorious. By the time you get to Acts chapter 2, he's standing in front of thousands. And that's what God wants to do inside of all of our lives. We are going to learn how to surrender ourselves to Him. That's called discipleship. That's called allowing Him to have the authority inside of our hearts and souls. And then we submit to Him. Paul would say it this way. He would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I believe Peter is going through his own crucifixion. He's dying to self. And it's going to be difficult. He leaves in heartbreak and despair, but God is not done with him. He will be restored. He will be brought back to a a healthy relationship with the Lord. God has great plans for Peter's life, and it is going to be a great day when he returns. But right now, Peter leaves the scene, and he goes off into the, the dark night, and he weeps bitterly. And it's going to be a difficult few days for Peter as his Lord is crucified and he fails in what he thought he could do. His self-perception, his intentions fall short. After Peter leaves and and, uh, Jesus is still bound in the house of Caiaphas, he is then transferred to another character within the story. We've talked about the religious establishment. We've talked about uh, Peter. And then there's another man in the story, and this is the first time we've heard of him, but he's always been around. His name is Pilate. Pilate is the governor of this area, and he is the one that the Jews are trying to frame to crucify Christ. You see, they're going to say in just a little while that they don't have the authority to put Jesus to death. That's kind of not true. Luke 24, or Leviticus 24, 16 says that anybody who blasphemes the name shall be put to death, shall be stoned. They could stone Jesus. They could put him to death. He has blasphemed the name. He has claimed to be God. That's blasphemy. They've tried to do that in the past. They've discovered that they're not able to do that politically. You see right now inside of Jerusalem at this time, there's a significant amount of the population, a high percentage that believes exactly that about Jesus. They believe that he's the Messiah. And I believe what the Pharisees are really afraid of is losing their position. The religious establishment is afraid that they're going to lose their hold on power and authority inside of Jerusalem. And so they've got to figure out a way to have Jesus destroyed, to have him killed without doing it themselves. That way, if they can get Rome to do it, let's say, then then what they can then do with the crowd that believes that Jesus is the Messiah, they can blame the Romans. And they can use the Romans as a scapegoat. They can hold on to their authority, and then they can blame the Romans, and then they can maybe start a riot and have Rome suffer the consequence of this. And so I believe they're trying to set Pilate up. They're trying to use him. But don't feel bad for Pilate. Pilate has no love for the Pharisees. In fact, he hates them as much as they hate him. There's no love loss here. And so when they come to him early in the morning, they uh, bring Jesus to his courthouse. And of course, they're not going to go inside of Pilate's palace. They're not going to get inside of his home because they don't want to be unclean for the festival that they're enjoying. They want to maintain a level of uh, ritual cleanliness, which is kind of funny. They're they're trying to kill an innocent man, yet they don't want to be defiled by going into a house. There's some silliness here. They answered, or Pilate comes out and he says, what accusation do you bring against this man? I think this caught them off guard. I think they were hoping that Pilate would just give them a rubber stamp verdict and sentence Jesus to death. The fact that they brought him here was enough. They felt that Pilate would then just execute Jesus and then they could frame the Roman government. But Pilate throws them a curveball, which I think he knew very well what he was doing. He throws them a curveball and so they answer him in a cloaked way. They say, if this, uh, in a cloaked way, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. I believe that they're just wanting Pilate to take their word for it. And so Pilate doesn't play. He's dispatched the Roman cohort. He knows that who Jesus is. He knows that he's coming. And they're hoping that Pilate will just take their word for it. But Pilate is not going to fall into their trap. He simply says, take them and judge themselves by your own law. And then they lie. They say it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And this is to fulfill what Scripture has said about the way Jesus would die. It says his bones would not be broken. Your bones are going to break if you are stoned. And so this is a way, of, and then it also says that he is going to be lifted up. And so crucifixion would uh, fulfill that prophecy as well. And so here you have Pilate caught in the middle. But don't feel bad for Pilate. He's going to ask Jesus seven questions over the course of this next section of Scripture. He's going to ask him in verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 33. He's going to say, are you the king of the Jews? I think this is probably asked with a 
a, a mocking sarcasm. So are you the king of the Jews? Kind of laughing at him. He'll say in 1835, am I a Jew? That's kind of with a, a haughty spirit of contempt towards the Jewish people. He doesn't want to be considered to be one of them. And then he'll say with some pompous display of authority, what have you done in, in uh, John 18, 35? Again, and then 37, I think it starts to take a turn. In 1837, he says, are you a king then? And they have a discussion about the kingdom of the Lord. And then in verse 38, he'll say, what is truth? And this is out of a contemptuous uh, pity on Jesus. And I, I don't think this is a section where he's asking as much a philosophical question. I think what Pilate is wrestling with here is he understands that he is in a situation where truth does not matter. He knows what the truth is. The religious leaders know what the truth is. And it doesn't matter. He's caught in a bind. He knows what the truth is. He knows what is right. But he is unable to act upon it. He'll ask another question in verse 8 of chapter 19. He'll say, where are you from? Jesus doesn't answer that question because it doesn't matter. He's now asking questions that he's trying to find a way out of the situation. And then in uh, chapter 19, verse 10, he says to Jesus, Do you not know that I have authority to release you or crucify you? I think this is done out of just pure arrogance. He's grabbing at straws. He's trying to find something to hold on to. And Pilate has been trapped. He's been trapped by his own arrogance. He's been trapped by his own plotting. He knows exactly what the truth is, but he refuses to do what is right. The final blow to our friend Pilate here is when the religious leaders accuse him of not being a friend of Caesar. That was a big deal when he says that he is not a friend of Caesar. Um, because to be called a friend of Caesar is to basically to solidify your position of authority and to solidify your position of influence inside of the Roman Empire. It was a way of saying that you're good friends with uh, Caesar. And it was a way of identifying yourself as somebody of importance. And so when they say to him, you are of no friend of Caesar, it was really a final blow to, to Pilate and his hopes of getting out of this without losing his position and his status inside the Roman Empire. And so he tries to wiggle free in many different places. He knows that Jesus is innocent. In fact, he'll declare Jesus innocent three times. He'll also try to trade for Jesus in Barabbas. If he'll let Barabbas go, maybe Jesus will, will uh, uh, he'll take Jesus, but he's hoping that they'll, they'll want Jesus released instead of a murderous thief. And of course, they choose to take Barabbas. But three different times, he will say, I find nothing wrong with this man. He'll have him flogged. He'll have him beaten. He'll have him terribly abused, all in an attempt to try to get him out of crucifying Christ. But Pilate is our character, and don't think of him as being a tragic character. He willfully knows exactly what is going on. He knows that Jesus is innocent. He tries to release him. He's urged by his wife to release him. He ignored his wife. Men, take note. Don't ignore your wives. He ignores his wife in this whole case. He knows exactly what he is supposed to do, and he refuses to do it. He hardens his heart, and the reason that he does this is because he's just pure selfish. He's consumed with his own self-interests. He not only did what was wrong to save himself. The trial is a complete sham of justice unless you see it as exposing the evil that is inside of man's heart. And that's really what it does. We know that Jesus is innocent from the moment of birth. We know that he has no sin in him. He's done nothing wrong. What we see in this trial is Jesus standing in the middle of a religious institution that has ignored everything that he has said. We see him standing as a, a rock in front of Peter, the rock, showing him this is what it means to be close. And Peter fails and denies him. The religious institutions, they fall short of what they're supposed to do and they ignore the truth. Peter falls short. He has great intentions, don't we all? But he falls short. He fails in this moment of trial. And then we have Pilate who represents a Gentile empire, a government, and it falls short. Not for a lack of evidence, but for a lack of courage of doing the right thing. Pilate knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He just lacked the courage to do it. And he was filled with selfishness. This trial reveals what's going on inside of these three things. Man, religious institution, and the government. It reveals what's inside of them. It reveals an arrogance and an ignorance from the 
religious leaders, they just ignored everything that Jesus ever said. It reveals that intentions don't matter. It reveals that selfishness and man's contempt for doing what is right rules the day. It reveals that Scripture has always said that man is lost without hope and without God. We know from this trial that Jesus is innocent. He's done nothing to deserve this. And we discover once again that man is guilty. On every level, man falls short. It's a very difficult passage. I've had to wrestle with it all week, and and that's one of the heavy things about Easter is you can't really celebrate the sunrise of Easter morning, the resurrection of the Lord, unless you really grapple with the depravity of man, what man has become, and the evil that is inside the heart of man, inside of man's institutions, inside of the individual man, and inside of government, is that man fails and it falls short. And we have only one hope, and that hope is in Christ. And so how do you bring all of this home? What do you do with this? Well, don't put your faith in religious institutions. Don't follow in their steps either. They tend to ignore things. Don't do that. Embrace Christ. Don't ignore Him. Maybe you've heard sermons online. You've watched a lot of them online the last couple of weeks. Don't ignore Christ. Embrace Him as Savior. They didn't. You can. Ask Him to be your Savior. Maybe you have. Don't don't rest on your intentions. Let them have the whole of you. Don't isolate your finances from God. Don't, Don't isolate your morality from God. Don't isolate your career from God. Let them have it all. Let him have everything inside of you and don't deny him anything. And don't be like Pilate. Have courage. It takes courage to do what is right, especially if you're the only one doing it. Have courage. Stand up for what is right. Do not act out of selfish intent. Don't ignore the things that God is showing you. Don't ignore them. Embrace them. Have courage. And don't ignore your wife. That's always a bad day. (laughs) The sun sets. They're pretty. But it indicates that something has come to an end. In this part of the story, the sunset of Christ's earthly ministry, the part of the ministry where he showed the Father healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water, and feeding thousands, and so much more. Now we move into that period where he's showing the Lord, or showing the Father through suffering. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which, which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. We have been made alive through his death. When the sun sets, when darkness comes, is a dark day, but it only makes the sunrise that much brighter. And we look forward to that day on Resurrection Sunday. Well, thank you once again for joining us today at Odessa Bible Church Online. We continue to lift up in prayer our government officials from local, state, all the way to the federal government as they manage this crisis. We pray that it's behind us quickly. We continue to pray for you here in the Permian Basin. We know that difficult times are underneath all of this with the price of oil and loss of jobs. And so if there's anything that we can do to pray for you specifically, anything we can do to help, please let us know. God is with us and we look forward to being uh, delivered from this time of chaos. The Lord bless you this week. Bye-bye.